So Pete, so far we have spoken about Indigenous peoples, their histories, their diversity, uh, and also how they transfer knowledge. Um, and that's through things like song and dance and stories. What I want to talk about now is how that knowledge is uh, spread across a particular community or even uh, potentially across multiple communities. Yeah, so indigenous knowledges and, and astronomical knowledge in particular is useful for a variety of reasons. So it's used for predicting the weather, uh, animal patterns and behaviours here on Earth, as well as navigation and those sort of things. And because this knowledge is tied to things that are so essential to everyday life, mm. it's considered general knowledge in that it's sort of something that, that everybody knows. It's shared amongst the community. And that's why... Um, this information being general and, and being open to everyone is why we can stand here and we can share this knowledge with all of you. Of course, that's not true of all knowledges. So there are some sort of sacred and, and secret knowledges that require people that are you know, of the appropriate age or even the appropriate gender to, to be able to know that and their role within the community is to hold that information and ensure that it mm -hmm. um, serves its purpose within the community as well. But there are also other pieces of information which are even more sort of widely spread than that. And that's to, to sort of lessen the load on people, right? Mm -hmm. So that no one person is sort of responsible for knowing everything. And if something was to happen to that person, how much of that knowledge would be lost, right? So, mm -hmm. and then uh, even going on there, um, the, um, some of these stories are actually part of a bigger saga, right? And they're actually stored across um, different languages and different language groups even um, and we'll explore a little bit of that today. Yeah so we will touch on this a lot more later down the line but just for now uh, I want to introduce this idea of storing pieces of information uh, into large geographical areas uh, and we generally call these song lines um, they can also be called uh, dreaming tracks sometimes um, sometimes even dreamings they're called uh, but essentially these uh, song lines uh, they document the land, the ocean, the skies, and everything in between that. Uh, they talk about roots and they mark roots on the land um, in order to get to a particular destination further along. Um, and these these markers uh, that are signified in the land, they are also often uh, reflected in the sky. So they also have a counterpart that can be seen in the sky. Now, a really great example of this comes from uh, the Western and Central Desert area in their songline, the Seven Sisters songline. Now, this describes a journey of seven sisters, as we hear from the title, um, and this, of course, refers to the Pallades Cluster. Um, now, these sisters in the story, they are being chased or pursued by uh, a man, the Orion constellation, as we've heard in many of these tales before. Uh, now, this story begins on Matu country. Now, this is in Western Australia, near Roburn. Uh, the sisters, they are being pursued and so they start to head inland. They start to head east uh, where they eventually um, end up in the APY lands, which is in Central Australia then. So once they arrive, uh, this whole way, they've been leaving little um, features in the land as they're being chased. And these features, they confuse the, the pursuer, they confused um, Orion. And this gives the sisters an opportunity to head back west. Um, now this time, they end up in Nayadira lands, which is in Western Australia. But eventually, when they do get to this location, one of the sisters is caught. Now, in this saga, we've spoken on a few different countries uh, and a few different language groups as well. And each one of these language groups, and actually more than what I have mentioned, they are responsible for storing uh, and maintaining and sharing their own little piece of this massive saga. And yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, there are um, similar uh, examples where people of specific genders or 
specific ages are responsible for particular types of knowledge. And an example of this is, comes from the Torah Straits, where they say that when the, the rising of a star is expected, that the old men uh, have the duty to watch out for this star. They get up when the birds begin to, to call in the morning, and they watch till daybreak, and the setting of the star is watched in the same sort of way. Um, now this is a useful technique in terms of sharing the knowledge amongst different people within the community, uh, again, to not overburden one single person with that knowledge. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Now, knowledge of different parts of the sky can also be divided among different moieties. Now, a moiety is, can also be considered as, um, say, a, a kinship group. Now, these are systems, these kinship systems, um, we generally refer to them as, uh, they generally divide uh, a whole group up into smaller subsections. Um, now, the members of the community are placed into one of those uh, subsections or one of those moieties, um, and they also ultimately determine, you know, who you can marry um, or who you can't marry, <laughs> and obviously to avoid things like uh, inbreeding. Now, depending on the ancestral story attached to a particular object or a particular star in the sky, a certain moiety will be responsible for that object or that star. Now, another really great example of this is on Groot Island. Now, this is really East uh, Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. And what the people on Groot Island do is they split the sky into two. And the stars on the East, they belong to the Wirinkapara people. And then or moiety and then the stars on the west they belong to the Arinkapura moiety. So another example of this comes from the Arenti people uh, in, cent in central Australia who have come up with a really clever star classification system that groups red, white, blue and yellow stars. Now this classification system is useful to the Arenti people for categorizing um, different areas of the sky mm. Um, which is then useful for disseminating knowledge of the stars amongst the members of the community. Now there's a very similar example of this within Western astronomy here, the, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. But interestingly enough, star classifications like this didn't come along in Western science until the late 1800s. Mm, very interesting. So the ways in which indigenous astronomical knowledge is shared within a community uh, generally has one member responsible for their own part of the sky. And that means the knowledge is very accessible. It's also maintained uh, with its own protocols attached to it. Now, techniques such as this, um, you know, how knowledge is shared within the community. This not only ensured the survival of indigenous peoples who very much lived in harmony with their, their land and their skies and surroundings for over 65,000 years, but it also serves as the oldest scientific database known to humanity.